Thank you for being here again at our Child Collection Conference. Um, I'm just going to give you the briefest introduction for these two people. I've known them both for quite a long time. Uh, it's uh, Caleb Roberts, who was a graduate student here in natural resource management, and the husband of my um, former assistant, Sarah. So um, I've known him and Sarah for a long time and appreciate them both greatly. Um, they've moved up to Lincoln, Nebraska, where Caleb is continuing his graduate studies there. Uh, and then we also have Professor Kurt Caswell from the Honors College, and I have worked with him in uh, the classes, uh, showing the students how to do archival research and talking to them about the writers. But he has really always done the heavy lifting of helping them craft their essays and their stories and their things that they've presented here throughout the year. So um, I think they both have a common theme in their essays, uh, memoirs of, of walking, and they will tell you more about their pieces when they're here. Thank you very much. Okay. So this is... I guess it's a memoir or essay or something that, that I wrote about Sarah's family <laughs> and me. So um, I'm renaming the names. They're either abbreviated or they're not the real names. And yeah, so. Is it? Or okay. I, I'm just not leaning into it. Excuse me. Okay. So I'll just start. Okay. The day after Christmas, my father in law, I'll call him Jay. And I loaded up my new shotgun and a buck box of buckshot into his pickup and drove onto his small Kentucky farm to try it out. I'd never fired a shotgun, and Jay had offered to teach me how to use it. And I was very, I was very excited. It was warm for December, but we still dressed for cold. Him wearing brown stained oak coveralls and old rubber boots, and me in some new Carhartt double pleated pants, leather hiking boots, and an insulated flannel. We bumped along in his truck, not using any road or path, until we reached the edge of one of his woodlots. We set up old Coke cans as targets, hanging them from low-hanging twigs. The shots filled everything with their cracks, and the woods were quiet and gray while we passed the gun between us and reloaded. I did not see a single bird flush from the sh our shots. They must have flown, flown low and silently away from Jay's shots because they were in no danger from mine. When we, ran, when we ran out of shells, we packed the shotgun into its case and we loaded it into the truck bed. I began kicking through the brown grass and brambles for used shell casings. Leaning against the truck bed, Jay told me not to worry too much about them. He said that there were probably more shells scattered or buried out there than we could ever find. He and his dad used to hunt around there. But I tried anyway. It was, not, it was litter to me, and I was taught never to litter but I couldn't find them all. I threw what shells I could find in the truck bed and opened the cab door to get right back to the house. But Jay did not get in. Instead, he asked me if I wanted to walk with him up to into his woods and around the fence line. I immediately agreed, and we headed into the woods. I won the shotgun just a few weeks before in a drawing during a conference where ranchers met to learn about how to manage their pastures and rangelands. They drew for prizes during the buffet dinner, and when they called my name, I walked up to the front to claim my prize, and I passed about 100 ranchers, older or middle-aged, wearing vests, flannels, and cowboy hats. This was in Nebraska, sitting around a large, around large round tables, finishing up their buffet dinners. I wore a brown Levi canvas button-up and jeans that I bought at a thrift store and that I hoped make, made me look rugged to fit in with them. But when the announcer lady handed me my gun and began snapping pictures of me holding it, because Pheasants Forever had donated it, they wanted the press, right? I, I, was re I, was, I realized I was holding a shotgun for the first time in front of a group of men and women who had grown up hauling shotguns in their trucks and all over their lands to hunt pheasant and quail. They grew up knowing what it meant to own more than a quarter acre of land. 
and many of them grew up depending on the land for their livelihoods. The land was just part of who they were. I, on the other hand, grew up in the suburbs of Louisville, Kentucky. I climbed the old red maple in our backyard, weeded dandelions from our front lawn, and went on weekend day trips to nearby parks with names like Otter Creek, Jefferson Memorial Forest, and Iroquois Park. When we went on hikes, my parents made me wear duct tape inside out around my ankles to catch the ticks. And before we headed home, we ate lunch from Ziploc baggies sitting at picnic tables. So except for the humidity, I experienced nature comfortably in shorts, t-shirts, and bookended with car trips and AC. As I grew older, I moved onto camping and backpacking and canoeing. When I began studying ecology and wildlife science, I took seasonal wildlife technician jobs, moving to places with names like the Whitefish Range of Montana and the Yuha Desert of Southern California for the summers. Seeing and living in land I had never dreamt of as a kid, learning the names of plants and birds and lizards and how they coexisted and persisted in an unforgiving world, I started to feel like I understood nature and the land. And that understanding seemed to bring a, or bridge a gap I had had for a long time. Identifying the plant species gave me something to love and search for in the woods. And knowing what kind of bird was calling from the thicket, even when I could not see it, brought familiarity to something that was otherwise unknown. But I never felt fully part of the land. There was me and there was it. And at the end of the field day or the summer, I would return to my suburban house or my apartment and the lines were drawn again. I suppose going out for a while and then coming back is a common thing for people, and it's not unique to me. I mean, it's reinforced even by the notion that I was raised with that the land is and nature is sacred. And the very notion that the lander is holy or set apart demarcates us in it. And even as I grew up in understanding of it through the lenses of science, its complexity, the interwoven spatial temporal scales of ice ages, ice age extinctions to hourly generations of microbes, the abiotic and biotic feedbacks uh, that sustain systems like tides and wildfires, and the redundancies and diversities of functional traits like decomposers and carnivores that enable ecological systems to persist and maintain their identities through time and disturbance made me realize how little we know and how simplistic like tinker toys our models of nature are. The familiarity, the holiness, and the unknowability melded in me. Uh, nature became a sort of beloved holy stranger. They weren't big woods and they seemed smaller because Jay had just logged them a few years before. Thin twiggy oaks and elms stretched up beside jagged stumps as wide as wells, and bulldozer tracks churned the bare earth and mud around stumps and underbrush. We walked up slope along one of the tracks. They made clear, if uneven, paths. I had seen the woods once before. They were logged during a summer. It had been a bit of a challenge to find a way through the foliage and blackberry thorns. And once inside, two layers of canopy shut out the sky and there were enough dead leaves and poison ivy thickets to cover up any stumps from any other loggings that may have occurred there in the past. It made me sad to see the woods like this, and I asked Jay why he had done it. Jay said he did because his mother, I call her grandmama, was getting sicker, and she needed the money for hospital bills and the sitter they, that saw her every day. And I, then I felt ashamed that I had asked, but Jay didn't seem to mind. At the top of the hill, a little pond nestled in a circle of dead leaves. Little cedars and elms were pushing through a small berm holding the eastern side. Dead water grass swayed in the black water. Seeing me looking at it, Jay stopped too. He told me his dad made this pond a long time ago. Sarah and her cousins used to, sorry, my wife, I was gonna rename everyone. My wife and her cousins used to frog gig in it, he said, and they used to 
catch quite a few. He never ate one, though, and he said he never would. Uh, he, he, once in, he said once his buddy was driving into these woods early in the morning to set up for a hunt, and he drove this truck straight into the pond. Jay and his dad had to drive their own truck in and haul him out. I asked him if that had upset his dad, and he said no. His dad didn't get set over much, upset over much. We didn't say anything for a moment after that. I was thinking about Jay's dad, granddaddy, as they call him. I asked if granddaddy made the pond for cattle. Jay said, yeah. I asked why he didn't cut the woods down for the more pasture then. Still looking at the pond, Jay said he didn't know. He guessed his dad just wanted to keep some woods. Sometimes the cattle used to come back in here, but granddaddy fenced off the area a long time ago. It's just for the frogs now, Jay said. Granddaddy's been dead a long time now. He's not mentioned much, but when he is, it always involves a farm. The little I've learned about him makes me wish I could have known him, though. Jay and my, my wife tell me Granddaddy and I would have had a lot of common, a lot to talk about. But I think the differences between us, how we viewed the land, how we related to the land, are what I most wish I could have learned about with him. So every time he's brought up, brought up, I ask as much as I can. When he married Grandma, my grand, granddaddy bought his first acres, 50 acres of land. And soon after his son was born, Jay, he bought an adjacent 50 acres. He cleared most of the oak hickory forest away for cattle pastures, hay fields, and a house for his family. In the middle of the largest pasture, he raised a barn where he cured tobacco, dried potatoes for winter, and banded the cat male calves before they went to the auction. He kept a hog pen behind the house, and when the hog fattened up, he would slit its throat and hang it at bottom up in the barn to drain the blood onto the ground. He raised bees in the back pasture, and when he tended the hive and retrieved the honey, he let the bees crawl over him, but they didn't sting him. In the mornings, he would check on his cattle, finding mothers with new calves hiding in the trees, searching their eyes for gumminess that indicated pink eye, and putting out hay in winter or rotating them to another field in summer. In the evenings, he would run trap lines along the creek and cast, catch muskrat and beaver for pelts. And then he'd go check on his cattle again. When my wife was little, Granddaddy would sit on the porch with her in the summer mornings, looking over his hay fields and cattle pastures and point to birds flying by and name them for her, whistling their songs back to her and them. When he was diagnosed with terminal cancer and refused chemotherapy, my wife remembers sneaking down to the basement stairs and seeing him sitting stone-faced, stripped to his underwear on a, not my grandfather, but he tried, he didn't try, in a metal uh, belt watch basin while grandmama and my wife's aunt poured and scrubbed blood from the chickens he raised all over him, trying to cure what the doctors couldn't with that medicine. And when he was lying on his back in the bedroom, uh, waiting to die in his own home, on his own land, he would let his grandchildren get up on the bed with him and roll matchbox cars over his round belly. Now, I don't want to, I just did maybe, but I don't want to romanticize his life or make it out that he had a deep mystical connection with nature. Granddaddy just lived a hard life. He was poor growing up, and his farm never made him rich. And everything he gleaned from the land he bought because he worked very, very hard. Still, I wondered what he thought about the land. I venture to guess that he never did anything that I would call hiking. And he probably didn't camp for recreation. He cut acres of forest, but he also left the woods intact. He grew crops, and he shot squirrels and butchered, butchered cattle to feed his family. His land was his source, and I'm certain he loved it. But while he knew much more about the harshness and demands of the land, I doubt he ever viewed it as something set apart or holy. From everything I can tell, he did not separate the land from his life or his will. He was just a farmer, and he just knew as he tended his land. <clears throat> we walked along a low fence, 
they said the land on the other side of his neighbors was Virgil's. That was the guy's name. Past the fence, through a stand of big old oaks, some cattle stood and some laid around a, a hay ring and a small green field surrounded by woods. Jake commented on how good the cattle looked, how good of a farmer Virgil was. Waving toward the northeast, Jay said Virgil had a big hog house, although all that could be seen in that direction was trees. When Sarah was little, Jay said he used to visit Virgil at his hog house. And Virgil would give Sarah a handful of piglets and ask her to mind them while he and Jay talked. I remember Sarah telling me the same story. She said the piglets were such sweet, pinky, pink roly-polies and uh, always trying to get away and snuffle in the muddy floor and play with each other. She also told me about seeing hulking, grime-crusted sows lying in the brown sludge and the surrounding pigs and how they scared her. A little way ahead, a giant white oak stood just on Virgil's side of the fence. Its branches twisted and crooked in all directions, forming almost a ball of limbs in the canopy. Many of them arching across the fence, the bigger ones' gray bark cracked and plated like jigsaw pieces. The tree surrounding it rose nearly as high as it, but had the perfectly straight, thin trunks of quick growth. Now, I, I pointed the big one out to Jay, Jay, and I can never just never be not amazed by trees. And Jay nodded and smiled. He said it was a good-looking tree. Virgil told him that the last time he logged, that that one had looked too nice to log, so he just left it. It was, a, I guess, a witness to the selection for Virgil's sense of beauty. The woods opened up, and Jay's haze fields rolled upwards like a carpet in front of it. We paused, blinking a bit at them. After the brown and the gray of the woods, the field seemed almost iridescent green. I asked Jay what he seeded them with. Scuffing the grass with his boot, he said, a mix of fescue, timothy, and orchard grass. Sometimes he put out red top and white clover for po protein for the cattle, and it was if he could afford it. I knew none of these plants were native species, and that pastures like these were one of the largest cause of declines in species like cottontails, bobwhite quail, Henslow sparrow, dick thistles, that need taller bunch grasses to nest and forage be between the bunches. I know many conservationists and ecologists who would immediately suggest killing that pasture and reseeding with native warm season grasses, but I was wary of saying it so blatantly, and not just because Jay's my father-in-law. Standing out there in the field his father had cleared and planted where he harvests hay for his, can his cattle's winter food. It seemed pretty arrogant and ridiculous to suggest it. But I suppose my training got the best of me because I asked him if he ever thought about plant putting out native grasses. He said he thought of it, but it was expensive, and his field seemed to do fine, and his cattle liked it. Not coming from land, I, I often think of what I would do if I had some. Because I've been trained in ecology and wildlife management, I would probably manage it. I think of sowing native warm season grasses back on the pastures or letting some of the land grow back up in the forest or up into forest. I imagine the pastures full of common yellow throats and grasshopper sparrows singing and nesting unseen in shoulder high grass. And I see the woodlots, not quite old growth, but still a thick solid block of green rising far above the grasses. The summer tanagers, blood red bodies, appearing and disappearing along the edges. I would still keep some of the hay fields and pastures because I would like to learn how to farm and my wife wants some cattle, but mostly I see a small refuge, almost a garden that I would tend. My wife told me that when her mother, Dora, I'll call her Dora, began planting trees around her new home on the land, granddaddy could not believe it. He told her he had spent all that effort clearing the trees out, and there she was planting them back. The trees were huge now, though, lining the driveway and circling the house, and Dora was glad for the privacy from the road they'd lend. For me, thinking of Granddaddy's reaction makes me feel a bit childish for wanting to make a Garden of Eden out of the farm, but still, I want to try.
my wife and I tell each other we'll move back to the farm one day, and we tell Jay and my mother-in-law, Dora, so too. They nod and tell us they're more than happy for us to come back, but they say it in passing and do not dwell on it. I don't think they believe us. A sudden crashing and crunching to our left brought our heads around. Two do does bounded out of a gully crisscrossed with felled logs and bramble. After watching them leaping through the pasture and disappearing over the hill, I told Jay how strange it seemed that they didn't flush when we were shooting, but he was not surprised. He said they were everywhere back there. He said he and Granddaddy used to hunt back in here all the time, and after Granddaddy died and Jay quit hunting, he would let his neighbors and friends come out to hunt there. Two of them in particular, a father and son, after they got anything, would always drive their pickup back to Jay's house and show them, show Jay his kill or their kill and thank him. Jay said, my wife used to go and play with the carcass, lolling its head around by the rack and tracing the outline of the s smooth, muddy hooves with her fingers. We kept walking along the fence line toward the horizon. Sumac and mulberry and sassafras grew tall and thick along the fence line, dovetailing just to sprouts closer to us. I said, that, you know, that's probably really good rabbit habitat. And Jay told me that's what he liked, he, to see the foxes and rabbits and deer playing in the fields. And at that time, he, he pointed over to a hill in the distance. He said in the evenings, he can see deer silhouetted against the twilight horizon, browsing his fields and, and warily vigilant. But he said granddaddy would have hated the untidiness at the fence line. He always liked to keep it cut and nice right up the wood posts. We turned away from the fence line, heading through the hayfields to the truck. The hayfield centered on a hill, and when we crested it, we could see much of the 100-acre farm surrounding us. Another hayfield, also Jay, sloped down to the road to the west. The woodlot that we had just left sat in a bowl to the east. On the top of the hill to the southwest, we could see Grandmama's house, the one that Granddaddy had built, peering through the line of trees separating the first 50 acres Granddaddy bought from the second 50. Beyond that, I knew there were cattle fields, an old, an old tobacco farm, more fields, woods, and then Crab Creek forming the eastern border of the farm. And far ahead, we saw the house Jay built and the tree-lined gravel drive that Dora planted with trees that connected the house to the paved road that bounded the southern half of the farm. It did not take long to reach the truck. We only walked a small part of a small farm, but just then it seemed large. As we drove back through the, along the bumpy, roadless field to the house, I asked Jay if my wife and I would ever, or excuse me, Jay asked me if my wife and I would ever let any children we might have walk out on the land with them. He said that maybe, I wouldn't believe it, but he, he would want to show them where we shot today and where to take them to find arrowheads by the creek, and he'd want to let them feed the cattle apples. I told him that I hoped he took our hypothetical children out every time we came to visit. We pulled onto the gravel drive and up to the garage. I got out and took my gun to the workbench and garage to disassemble it and clean it. Jay had just shown me how to do it yesterday. And Jay went to the house to see Dora and my wife. As I was beginning to swab the barrel, Jay came back out, called to me that he was going up to check on his cattle and grandma, and then he got back into the truck. I waved as he drove off. Watching the truck head up the paved road and disappear over the hill, I wished I had asked him if I could go with him. So there are a lot of similarities uh, between Caleb and me and our interests, and there's one key difference, and that is that uh, I have long hair and a short beard, while Caleb has short beard or short hair and a long beard. No one does what they do 
Sorry. I might have to get a little closer. Okay, thanks. No one does what they do in this world without help. Despite professions of his singleness, Prince is not possible without an artist like James Brown. Every artist, every human being, needs a wayfinder. Someone, someone who traveled those roads or someone who has built those roads and can show the rest of us the way. And I think I'm on firm ground when I say that for many people in this room, the writers whose papers are housed here in the Sal collection, uh, sorry, I lost my spot. The writers whose papers are held in the Sal collection um, are our wayfinders, and some of them are here in this room. When I was a master's student at uh, Bread the Breadloaf School of English in Vermont, a friend said to me, you got to read this novel, uh, The River Why, by David James Duncan. And I did. And what was so confusing about that novel is why its author was writing about me. And about at the same time, I discovered the work of Robert Michael Pyle. And I sat with 11 classmates uh, and my teacher, John Elder, and Bob himself on a rocky outcropping in Vermont in the rain, and we read and talked about his book, Wintergreen. And what was so confusing was why this guy was writing about me. And uh, before that, when I was 12 years old, my father, who was then the district ranger at Blue River, Oregon, he brought this little book home to me called River Notes. And he said, uh, there's some guy, uh, Barry Lopez, who lives here on the river, and he writes books, and this is one of them. And what was so confusing about reading River Notes uh, was why this guy, Barry Lopez, was living on my river and writing about me. <laughs> but that... Uh, that book, River Notes, as Jim put it on Thursday when we first met, uh, opened a door for me. So I want to say thank you to these guys, to all the uh, Sal writers, but especially to David and to Bob and to Barry. Whose life has been an example. So you've all made a very good trail for us, and so I say thank you for showing us the way. So I'm going to read a little piece called uh, Polar Bear Pass By. Polar Bear Pass By. Lonzo Meadows, Newfoundland, June 24th, 2015. North of the Long Range Mountains in springtime, where the road swings east off the long northerly climb up the west coast, and a little farther on, back to the north again, to the land's end on the northern peninsula of Newfoundland, a place where Norsemen and women came ashore 500 years before Columbus, and the great icebergs calved off the great Greenland ice sheet march along the eastern shore with the currents of the North Atlantic. Here, in this place, a polar bear passed by. Have you heard, the Parks Canada employee said to my partner Karen and me, a polar bear sighted on the road this morning about 10 clicks this side of the airport. We hadn't heard, Karen said. That's not far from here, is it? Not far at all, the woman said. I guess it was asleep in the ditch. Pretty common to see a few this time of year. They come down following seal. But it sounds like it was headed back out. Back out, I said. Back out to sea, she said. We had a two-day drive 
ahead to catch our flight out of St. John's. So we set off under the glory of those long blue skies and the sun shimmer off the water at Spiller's Cove, Naughty Bay, and Gunner's Cove, where Annie Prue wrote the shipping news. We stopped at St. Lunaire to buy jams at the Dark Tickle. Local berries, endemic to Newfoundland, partridge berries, squash berries, and fake apple berries. Have you ever seen a polar bear? Karen asked the shop's proprietor when news of the recent sighting came up. I had one try to get into my house, the woman said. It was pushing against the door. Luckily, the door opened out, so it was pushing the door closed, but it did get into another guy's house. He drove it back out with a shotgun, just the noise of it. He didn't shoot it. Then it came back here. We have some chain link fence in the back of the house to keep the dogs in. That bear cut right through it with its claws. Want to see it? We keep it to show tourists. <laughs> the fence section wasn't pushed in or bent. It was cut, raked right through by bear claws. Wow, I said. I like that word wow because when you flip it over it says mom. They're pretty strong, the woman said. Oh, and we had a couple of them, a mama and her cubs, cross the road here, right in front of the shop. So we were talking, Karen said, about how they're not really terrestrial bears, and they're not really marine mammals either. That's right, the woman said. The old people call them water bears. We traveled on, caribou feeding and loafing in the stone barrens. And then the road turned south again along the strait and along under Labrador, dark and rising on the other side. I thought of the oil worker at the B&B &B in St. John's a few days ago. He works on the largest oil platform in North America, he told us, some 300 kilometers offshore. One night, he and some of the guys watched two polar bears trying to get up onto the foot footings of the platform, maybe for a rest. The bear swam about for a bit, growling up at them, and then swam on. They're probably all right, the fellow said. They can swim two or three hundred miles. Coming into a place like Newfoundland, you come into the presence of such stories. And the more you travel in their presence, the more the stories become part of you. You can feel them becoming part of you, the way you can feel beach waves surging over your bare feet or cool fog pressing up a slate, or a knife point. I think it's right to talk about it this way, that such stories keep a kind of territory, and you have to come into that territory to have them. They extend outward, too, beyond both place and time, the places and times such stories are made. Surely long ago, those Norsemen encountered polar bears. The reach of such stories has limits. We don't talk, about, uh, talk much about polar bears in Texas, for example, except when we have this gathering <laughs> or when Bear is in town. So if you want a certain kind of story in your life, make a slow and patient journey into its presence and then wait for it to show up. Farther south at Jack's Ladder, we feasted on moose burgers, pea soup with a doughboy. It's like a little pudding, the cook told us, and cog cod tongue fried in scrunchions, the salted back fat of a pig. I'm going to fix you a real nice taste of Newfoundland, the cook had told us, and she did. That near encounter with a polar bear, the coming into the territory where an encounter may be possible, opened me to the realization that there's something missing from my life right now, a relationship with animals. In his book about looking, specifically the essay, Why Look at Animals, John Berger writes that the 19th century began 
with the 20th century finish, the breaking of, quote, every, uh, every tradition which has previously mediated between man and nature. I know you've heard this before, but that single statement, that single truth has been earth changing. Animals, writes Berger, constituted the first circle of what surrounded man. They were with man at the center of the world, of his world. And this world that Berger references here included a routine transmigration between the physical world and the spirit world. Animals came from over the horizon, Berger writes. They belonged there and here, and they were mortal and immortal. To go on, Berger writes that when an animal looks at you, you become aware of yourself in returning that look. And this exchange sets up the condition for our parallel lives. We needed each other, but we lived separate lives. With their parallel lives, Berger writes, animals offer man a companionship which is different from any offered by human exchange. Different because it is a companionship offered to the loneliness of man as a species. Animals, then, are an antidote to loneliness. Then along comes the Industrial Revolution, and in its first stages, animals are used as machines. Later, in the post-industrial societies, animals are treated as raw material, and today, animals required for food are processed like manufactured commodities, processed like cheese whiz and lean cuisine and tires. The archaeologist Chris Whitmore, and Chris Whitmore is on the faculty here at Texas Tech, the archaeologist Chris Whitmore's essay, Bovine Urbanism, the Ecological Corpulence of Boss Urbanus, is a horrifying affirmation of cattle as manufactured commodity. Whitmore toured a West Texas cattle feedlot. These feedlots he calls cattle cities. Places where the residents, cattle, are in a continual state of, quote, being toward slaughter. A nod to Heidegger's notion of being toward death, where humans exist both with the certainty of death and the uncertainty of when it will come. For cattle as commodity, the feedlot is just one step on a factory assembly line, or more precisely, a disassembly line, to use Whitmore's phrase. So human beings have moved from nomadic hunters on grasslands pre-agriculture to pastoral herders on grasslands, and then to pastured animals post-agriculture, and now to feedlots. The next advance for the meat industry, Whitmore, Whitmore tells us, is to decouple, quote, the breathing animal from edible flesh. That is to grow meat in a lab and leave the animal out of it. What is even more chilling to me than meat grown in a lab is the recognition, as Berger writes, that the, quote, reduction of the animal is part of the same process as that by which men have been reduced to isolated, productive, and consuming units. We have not only made cattle into a commodity, but we have made ourselves into a commodity. Our value is based on quantification, how much work we do and how much stuff we consume. According to Berger, animals, quote, may have played a crucial role in the development of human society, and we now live without them. And the fact that we live without them, Berger suggests, is probably an important factor in opening the way to modern totalitarianism, and it is irredeemable for the culture of capitalism. So I'm just gonna read uh, a little bit more from an essay called Death in Seville, stolen from Henry Ray's Death in the Afternoon, about a bullfight that I attended in 2009. 
um, the protest about bullfighting is always about cruelty. And so in light of what I was just talking about, um, it seems to me that the bullfight, uh, let's say the bullfighter and the bull are at the center of each other's lives, have parallel lives, and do exchange that look that Berger was talking about. And the feedlot cow, um, and also zoo animals, while they live like slaves, right, in captivity waiting for death, the fighting bull lives free in the countryside, and it also dies quickly and suddenly uh, in the arena. So here's just a little bit of that essay called Death in a Sink Hole. The relationship between men and bulls is at least 20,000 years old, as the most prominent and famous images among the paintings in the caves at Lascaux are four monstrous black bulls, the largest of which is some 17 feet long. Gilgamesh, in the epic of Gilgamesh, defeats the bull of heaven sent by Ishtar to cool his arrogance. Roman soldiers from the second to the fourth centuries practiced Mithraism, a religion in devotion to the god Mithra, a god of war, among other things, who was born from a stone and slew the great bull. These soldiers made sacrifices to Mithra, and in one of their rituals, inductees stood in a pit beneath a grate to be purified in the blood of a bull slaughtered above them. Much later on the Iberian Peninsula, mounted aristocrats hunted bulls in the countryside with lances. This practice led to bringing bulls in from the country to the city, where such aristocrats were fond of slaying bulls from horseback at festivals in a public arena. The modern Spanish bullfight is attributed to Fran Francisco Romero of Ronda, who developed the technique of killing bulls with the estoque after a series of dalliances with the Muleta in 1726. But the past is a story of who we were, and we are different now. Despite this difference, the bullfight flourishes in the modern world, as it did in the ancient. Why? I think bullfighting embraces what modernity left behind. Modernism is a wave ridden out from the wreckage of Romanticism, out from the Industrial Revolution which followed it. As we rode this wave, rode the great promise that technology would solve all our problems, that it would complete us like religion, like meaningful work, like love. We left the sacred mysteries of the natural world behind. We didn't need nature anymore. Instead of reverence, awe, and love for the mystery of life, we worship, we worship steel, oil, and the silicone chip. In his book, The Sacred and Profane, and The Profane, Mircea Eliade writes that, quote, it is only in the modern societies of the West that non-religious man, Eliade also uses the term profane man, has developed fully. In this world, it is not the universe that makes man, but man who makes himself. And he only makes himself completely in proportion as he desacralizes himself and the world. For the modern man, and so for modernity, the, quote, sacred is the prime obstacle to freedom. And this is, as this is so, it follows that the modern Spanish bullfight a highly ritualized ceremony which follows from the religio iconography of Lascaux through the Mithraic mysteries and into the Maestranza here in Seville should have long ago fallen from, the, from popularity and settled into a story of who we used to be. But it has not. The bullfight is alive and well in Spain and in other countries. Eliade goes on to assert that, quote, profane man cannot help pre uh, preserving some vestiges of the behavior of religious man. 
though they are emptied of religious meaning. He forms himself by a series of denials and refusals, but he continues to be haunted by the realities that he has refused and denied. Though profane man has desacralized the world of his ancestors, Eliade writes, he holds the sacred in waiting, quote, ready to be reactualized in his deepest being. Modern art is not only an expression of the modern world, but an expression of the failure of the modern world. Think on the fragmentation and confusion of Picasso's cubism, the dark nihilism of Eliot's The Wasteland, and Nietzsche's terrifying realization that God is dead. As a modernist himself, Hemingway registers his discontent in his lifelong devotion, in his, not his discontent in his bullfighting, but his discontent in modernism by his lifelong devotion to bullfighting. But instead of persevere, uh, preserving only vestiges of the sacred in a ritual empty of meaning, Hemingway sees the bullfight as sacred, as an antidote to modernism. When Nietzsche writes, quote, God is dead, God remains dead, and, uh, and we have killed him. How shall we confront, uh, comfort ourselves? Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Hemingway answers, the sacred, ri sacred ritual of the killing of fighting bulls in the ring. Antonio Barrera, Barrera, is that sound good? Okay. Antonio Barrera stepped into the ring for his second bull, the fourth bull of the day. The sun was lower in the sky, about halfway from where it was to where it would be. John and I sat our, uh, with our strange sun hats on, the heat coming in hard against us, an oppressive force that would not let up for another hour. This is John Busterian, who's a Spanish language professor here. Through Hemingway, I had imagined a more festive atmosphere, a wool beret, a bota of wine, which I sprayed expertly and joyously into my mouth, the energy and unity of the crowd in support of the bull and the bullfighter. But Hemingway was Hemingway. Here in Seville, I was nobody. We were all nobody. Even as we are about to witness this final moment of the bull's life, the tragedy of the bullfight was unfolding again before me for this, the fourth time, and I was missing it with inattention, the way you miss parts of a football game buying a hot dog or talking with your friend as I talked with John. I felt lazy and soporific, dulled and emblazoned by the sun. I wanted the whole affair to end so I could find relief from this terrible heat and then the sword went in. Aside from the graceful way Barrera moved, that he seemed not quite planted on the ground as the moleta whirled about him like a dancer's skirt, he was barely interesting. With Bautista, something was at least stirring in the crowd, some measure of discontent. Like the others, Bautista is a professional killer of bulls. He faces the bull and his fear each time in the ring, the way Hemingway faced the blank page. I don't, think it, I don't think it is fear of dying, but a fear of failing to face fear, of disappointing the crowd or not killing cleanly and so causing the bull to suffer, of losing a place among his brothers, of not finding the moment, the perfect moment when the universe coalesces and everything falls into place like tumblers in a loft, and knowing that moment as the moment, and so not missing it. Yet even missing it in the ring feels better than not going into the ring at all. In Seville, Bautista was raw, so that the audience experienced something of the rough edges that prove that a matador is also a man. We could see part of his process the working out of the problems of the bull, as though we were part of the working out of it, like holding up Hemingway's drafts next to the final story. 
What woke me from my strange lethargy was that Barrera's sharp calls to the bull, which echoed in the ring as if he were in some far off place, stopped. I came to attention to watch him ready for the kill. He stood sidelong to the bull with his feet together, sighted down the blade, stood up on his toes, went back down onto his heels, and then turned to face the bull with his chest bared, his one knee bent in an arc. And when the sword went in, it went in. First it was in Barrera's hands, and then it was inside the bull. That bull was so black and muscled, so powerful and hard, it looked impossible to penetrate it, but the sword went right in. The bull swung his great head, hooking one way and then the other, as Barrera's toreros came in fast with the capes to draw him out and away, out and away, as Barrera himself exposed now and vulnerable to those deadly horns, made himself a target, but an impenetrable target, impervious to the bull's violent tosses of his head, hooking and working the air to clear off the two and a half feet of steel deep in his body. He went down. The bull went down onto his belly, panting hard, huffing, the men moving variously in front of him, waiting, the blood now pooling up over his back where it rushed up the hollow along the blade and came red to the surface to pour out over his back, sticky and wet, and his head went down too. The crowd gave a rousing cheer and the clapping rose and settled and it was over. We waited a moment, a little space of silence in honor of the bull's life. The, tore the toreros moved in, the dead bull lifted his head. And then the bull came up undead onto his hind legs his head still down in his death near the yellow sand, red with his blood. And he stood that way like a dog at play. And a tremolo of voices rose in the crowd as the bull now rose too onto his feet, standing again on his four feet, swaying a little, the blood pouring out from the muerte, the place the sword went in. And we all felt something then. We all became someone in the low murmuring of our voices that became gasps and then heroic cheers rising and rising as the bull's power and desire to live crested as its life was leaving it. Here was that moment for the bull as it was for Barrera and for us, the sharing of the art between the man and the bull the resacralizing of the world. Was he a hero? The bull was walking blind, blood now pouring from its nose and mouth, its soul wandering back and forth between worlds as its feet seemed no longer attached to the ground, swaying from side to side in a lightness, a heaviness, a tree in the wind. He took a few steps forward then a few steps to the side and died on his feet, the ground coming away from him as he lifted to go and then fell over dead. The people cheered. Thank you. I guess I, I don't know, I, I feel, I, I feel like if, I, if this ever went out to some place and I didn't tell them, 
that it was a family I wouldn't want my family to be named. I don't know. I, I guess I want some anonymity for them if they want it. Just like privacy for them, I guess. I was thinking um, I, I think it's hard to say maybe what I was thinking but probably wasn't really thinking of anything but I think more like your experience I was probably feeling what you felt probably you know in the process of writing and just trying to reconstruct you know what I saw <laughs> what do I think about the silicon chip? Um, well, I use them every day. I mean, it's a, it's a broad question. I mean, I love the silicon chip, and I also hate it. And yeah. Is that what you're asking? I think what's troubling for me about that is that they're, they're lifeless, but we treat them as if they're alive. You know, so when I come into the classroom and I tell, say something about using phones in the classroom, I almost always say that that phone in your bag is like a little animal because it, it's like this thing that people always are thinking about. It's always on their mind, whether, you know, if you turn it off, it kind of goes away, but if you just silence it, you know it's there and you know some stuff is coming in, right? So that's my... Thank you for listening.